As the series ages, the train job becomes more and more of a strange outlier in the original 14 episodes. As the second episode in the series, the train job feels a little incremental. It almost beat for beat revisits all of Serenity's moments without feeling as though it's rehashing them, has a couple of fun action set pieces, and maybe moves the yardstick for a character or two a bit. And that's pretty much it. Don't get me wrong, I like the train job a lot. It's entertaining, a few of its repeated bits from Serenity are actually more fun. The the opening barroom brawl is great, and there's a lot of terrific humor here. Compared to the innovative places the series goes in almost every other episode, though, the train job feels a little... static? But of course... That's not the whole story. The Train Job wasn't originally the second episode of the series. Whedon and company produced the artful and elegant 90-minute episode Serenity to be the pilot for the series, and Fox didn't care for it. They supplied a list of changes and gave Joss and Tim Minear a weekend to write, essentially, a replacement pilot. So they needed to set up the same very complicated universe, introduce a large and complex cast of characters, provide a fun and captivating one-off story, avoid duplicating the same scenes from Serenity, and do all of that with 30 minutes less time? The train job is actually a bit of a miracle. It's Unification Day, the day the Alliance claimed victory over the Independents, and Mal happens to be enjoying a game in an Alliance-friendly bar with his chief sources of muscle while also wearing his brown coat. That's a bold move. A little on the edge. I've given some thought to moving off the edge. Talking about this episode poses a bit of an interesting challenge, given its dual role as first episode aired and the life it lives now as second in the series. I think in order to understand why the train job feels a little different from the rest, it's important to not treat it completely as the second episode in the series. But rather than re-explaining everything we covered in the Serenity video, which would feel redundant and yet is the unenviable task this episode had, I'm just going to connect the major beats to the ones we've talked about in the previous videos with a quick video visual indicator. And Mal's line here about the game board and wanting to move off the edge has the same dual function as Badger's did in Serenity. We'll never stop turning, Badger. That only matters to the people on the rim. Being about the actual verse itself. Inevitably, some Alliance dumbass does the inevitable. This is an auspicious day. There are a couple of fun layers going on here if we do a bit of over-reading, which, I mean, you're watching this video, so you being down for that kind of thing is assumed. First of all, he's trying to use the word auspicious, which is actually kind of wrong for this context. Generally, auspicious refers to signs today of coming good fortune in the future. The word is Roman in origin, and the auspexes were soothsayers who interpreted omens. Drunky here probably means historic or momentous. The day is actually auspicious for Mal because he's going to get to punch some Alliance Chuchong in the face. And his misuse of the word auspicious rather than auspicious, reinforced by Jane mishearing, suspicious, is just more fuel for the fire. Funnily enough, the parallels to Odysseus here would be an anniversary for the end of the Trojan War, in which Odysseus played a major part, but also caused the 20 year delay getting home for him. Odysseus, like many of the Greek fighters, admired Troy and the Trojans and considered it a tragedy when their city fell. Even a crude joke towards the end of a thousand year era would be a slight to Odysseus, and Mal takes it as such. Mal parks himself in a spicy position. The hero on the hero's journey often has that guardian, fate, usually, but here it's his metaphorical life. Things get testy and Wash saves the day with a bluff. River is still having nightmares. Did you dream about the academy? In Roman terms, the academy was where they sent their youth after primary school to learn speech and rhetoric for the purpose of oration and speaking fluently, and for River it's where she loses the ability to communicate. After Mal steps in for a quick visit, River makes the double meaning of his name concrete. Mal. Bad. In the Latin. So, again, while the name Malcolm is a heroic one, Mal is short for Malice. And Mal doesn't go by his hero name. Does he go by Mal because he thinks he's bad? If every character on the ship represents some aspect of Mal himself, then when Shepard Book probes Mal for his motivations in keeping the two fugitives on board, asking why a thieving man of thievery would want to keep two lambs on the ship and put his career at risk, when Mal responds, He's my hero. Book's retort with ways Simon is a hero are ways 
that resonate with Mal's character. There's not many would take him in either. In the commentary for the episode, Whedon and Muneer talk about having to hide trainloads of exposition, pun intended, in this episode, and I think you can feel the weight of that a bit in these first couple scenes. There was a civil war, Mal was on the losing side, this is a space western, River was tortured, her brother saved her, they're both fugitives, Mal has made them part of the crew. Nine minutes in and we've revisited a lot of the necessary info from Serenity. But River's calling out the possible meaning of Mal's name and his conversation with Book also sets up a structure to this episode that I really enjoy. When pressed as to why he's keeping the Tams on board, he responds sarcastically. Well, because it's the right thing to do. Inara is spending some time making Kaylee feel pretty and pampered, to which Mal takes issue. Your service and crew now? In your lonely, pathetic dreams. Whedon mentions in the episode commentary one of Mal and Inara's obvious inspirations I had overlooked, Beatrice and Benedict. The scene restates Mal's respect for her, but not her work. Respectable clients, that seems a contradiction. Don't start. And the paradox inherent therein. Mal confines Inara to the ship, believing he's doing the honorable thing trying to shield or protect her. But as we find out later in the episode, Inara doesn't need his protection. For the second time in two episodes, Kaylee brings up their crappy compression coil. I'm sure it'll be fine, though. Mal and the muscle go to meet Niska for the first time, and the door opens to Niska's muscly bound henchman, Crow. Niska, a rich, intimidating man who wants Mal to steal some cargo from the Alliance for him, was one of the requested additions from Fox, a big bad. Niska reveals a hanging, freshly corpsified former associate, and Mal makes an important statement given the episode's wordplay. Oh no, I'm sure he was uh, a very bad person. Mal. Bad. Book and Inara discuss their place on the ship. Inara has no clients, and Book says, I do feel awfully useless. As the crew preps for the robbery, Jane tells Kaylee the captain is probably going to turn in the Tams for profit. Why would he take on trouble like those two if there weren't no profit in it? Hmm? Captain's got a move he ain't made yet. The robbery goes off without a hitch, mostly, but at the destination, Mal and Zoe discover what they stole was medicine for a town in desperate need of it. Son of a bitch. The crew heatedly debates whether to run with the goods or wait for Mal and Zoe, I love the way River is often shot in these early scenes, not with a cut to her, but by revealing her through a camera motion, as though she were there the whole time, almost like she's a part of the ship. River babbles a bit of a foreshadowing line as she is bathed in blue light. Two by two. Hands. Blue. After Simon knocks out Jane for trying to take over, Book comes up with a plan to have Inara get Mal and Zoe out by pretending he is her escaped manservant. It's a great reversal of the scene from earlier and pays off Book and Inara feeling somewhat useless for the past two episodes. Inara goes to rescue Mal and Zoe in a dress so stunning, my words don't good much normal as they do as. Notice, too, the particular version of Mal's name she uses. Mal comes my indentured man. And Inara's job and career station, which Mal constantly shuns her for, bails everyone out. Her files were all in order? I ran them twice. When Zoe and Wash embrace, there's a nice juxtaposition in that actually codifies Inara and Mal as a love relationship, albeit one expressed through knee kicks and pigtail pulling. She hit me. Niska's men show up, a fight ensues. When Mal takes a hit, the first person to fire back and keep him alive is Zoe. Mal returns to the goods, and in a scene bookending the opening in which the shepherd was probing Mal for why he would keep the Tams on board. A man learns all the details of a situation like ours, and he has a choice. I don't believe he does. Back to that in a minute. Mal tries to give Niska his money back. Keep the money. Use it to buy a funeral. Darn. Crow was set up with a big, scary opening shot when they met Niska, creating our expectations for what role he'll play, which makes the engine kick utterly shocking and hilarious. This kind of beat is an incredibly weedony subversion, and I love it. I am a god, you dull creature, and I will not be bullied by that puny god. And the episode ends with another requested Fox edition. Two dudes and their two blue hands, or four, two sets of, uh... Being the outlier episode in Firefly is a bit like being the last picked Avenger. You're still one of Earth's mightiest heroes, and true to form, the train job is hilarious, with unexpected moments, lots of adventure, and some great character details. I also think the whole Fox fiasco raises an interesting question. Are there ways in which the train job works more successfully as a first episode? To be clear, I like Serenity more, I just think the question is interesting. And not more successful in a Fox executive, we're never gonna get people to sit through 
through 90 minutes of people eating strawberries and taking sponge baths give us more sparkly boomy things kind of way. Though when it comes to the business of getting eyes on a show, maybe that shouldn't be ruled out completely? As much as I love the melancholy and time-spanning cold open to Serenity, the train job's opening bar fight scene is so much fun. Whedon called the single shot of the man flying through a barroom window, western style, and the window being a hologram, the show in a nutshell. The ship's introduction is a stunner, almost like she's the tenth member of the cast, and she is. The whole scene delivers an incredible amount of information to the audience, while having an engrossing pace and humor. Where Serenity's opening is more of a beautiful cinematic slow burn, the train job feels to me like the opening of a television show. And that filters down. Serenity's 90 minutes feel like an unfolding stage play. Episodes like that in a show are often some of my favorite episodes and the most memorable. Think Data's Day in Star Trek The Next Generation, or Fly in Breaking Bad. But perhaps a pilot should be a little tighter and more energetic to get eyes on the show? Serenity is also Mandarin heavy, and just like any universe-specific affectation, it can take a little frackin' time for the audience to warm up to how things work. The train job is pretty Mandarin light. Alright, so enough of that. I feel dirty devil's advocating when the devil is Fox, and I wouldn't trade Serenity's slow, beautiful burn for anything, especially that dinner scene. Danny Walk away from this table. Right now. Setting the train job's pilot 2.0 elements aside, the episode has a really cool structure to it. Philosophically, Mal's final line to the sheriff, A man learns all the details of a situation like ours, and he has a choice. I don't believe he does always bugged me. Whedon has spoken before about his own personal philosophy. Existentialism is riddled throughout Buffy and Angel, and there's an episode of Firefly that reads like Whedon's take on Sartre's nausea. Fundamental to the idea of existential philosophy is choice. Yes, the universe is meaningless and indifferent to us, but by making choices and pursuing meaning regardless, meaning can ensue through the journey. I did my best to cover existentialism and choice in my video for the Buffy episode Lie to Me, linked in the top right. Mal's line initially confused me. But I think maybe I was misreading to what he was referring to? Let's unpack. The opening brawl over Unification Day serves to show us that Mal is still fighting the war people keep telling him he lost six years ago. And the duality of Mal's name that River and Book bring up introduced the question of the episode, what kind of bad is he? The city of Paradiso, where most of the episode takes place, is on the planet Regina, part of the Georgia system, which is one of the two systems that make up the border planets. And Paradiso is also part three of the Divine Comedy, in which Dante was guided through the spheres of heaven. Only in Firefly's Paradiso we see a vision of the paradise the Alliance was fighting for when they sought to unify the systems. The citizens are living a hard life, stricken with a disease their planet's unique atmosphere enables. Sure, the Alliance brings in medicine with a regiment, but when the medicine is taken they are nowhere to be found, leaving the people to fend for themselves through the worst part of it. That sounds like the Alliance. Unite all the planets under one rule so that everybody can be interfered with or ignored equally. Mal made the mistake of not asking Niska what he was stealing, but upon seeing the suffering of the people in Paradiso, immediately decides to give the shipment back. And I love the way that Zoe knows his why without him needing to say anything. We're bringing the cargo back. Because really, the episode is not about choosing between the Alliance or the Browncoats. In any war between two parties, there's always a third that makes out, no matter what. The Vulture, the Carrion Feeders, the crows. Scavengers with no loyalty or moral compass. They don't care who wins, but feast upon the dead equally. Man, too, is an organism born with a default self-interest that is functionally defined by the absence of choice. Why would he take on trouble like those two if there weren't no profit in it? Hmm? Nothing but impulse. Eat, sleep, survive. Existentially speaking, if the universe is intrinsically meaningless, so too is our default state of self-interest. Niska and Crow, then, represent the pull of that meaningless universe on Mal. So the choice isn't really picking between two ideologies. The choice is not what he believes in, but whether to believe in anything at all. And that's one Mal already made. A long time ago. Mal's sincerity almost always emerges from his actions and not the things he says. Verbalosity is really just another opportunity for cunning. And his two acts of shocking violence in Serenity and the Train Job both make the same conclusive statement if in the face of two different enemies. Mal has decided what kind of bad he's going to be. He's going to be the bad that rebels. Rebels against Niska because Mal has a guiding ethos. Who rebels against the Alliance because laws don't define what's right. And an 
unjust law is still wrong. He's Mal, and he's Malcolm. Ow! He's on his own journey. <laughs>